Welcome, everybody. We're so delighted that you could join us today. My name is Jennifer Rigg, and I serve as the Executive Director at the Global Campaign for Education US, or GCE US. We are really delighted uh, to be here today for the August 2023 GCE US Coalition meeting with just such a fantastic uh, conversation and array of really wonderful community global leaders and youth and student advocates. Um, so we're grateful to all of you for joining today. And um, in particular, I want to thank our amazing student and youth fellows uh, who you'll be hearing from throughout the conversation today. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to meet them yet, they're outstanding and um, really made all of this happen. So we want to um, honor and thank everybody that has, has helped to bring this fantastic program together. Please do introduce yourself in the Zoom chat box with your name, your organizational affiliation, and location. Where are you Zooming in from today? For today's event, we have captioning as well available in English um, with apologies that it is a version um, <laughs> that is uh, available through, through Zoom, um, but um, piloting. And so we'd love to hear your feedback as to how, um, if it's a helpful resource. Um, so huge thanks to these amazing speakers on the screen. If we go to the next slide, um, there's a little bit of information on uh, to what we will, just the logistics for today. We are recording, as you can see, and materials and, record, and the recording will be shared afterwards. Event organizers will use the chat box to share announcements and information. And please, we'd like to hear from all of you. you please use the Zoom chat box for your questions, your comments, announcements, sharing across the community of opportunities so that we can together um, advocate for the right, the human right to quality inclusive education for all. And the next slide gives us a little bit of information about how to turn on closed captions. For most people within Zoom, you might see a, a button that says CC for closed caption at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And um, this gives you a little bit of guidance if you'd like to arrange for a different, for translation um, from English to another language as well. Uh, so when you click on the menu button for, or the up arrow, Next to that CC button, you can select speaking language. Most of the, the um, information today will be in English. And then you can also select the translate to button and select the language that you would like your captions to be translated to. So just let us know if you have any questions. There's an example here. Um, and if you click the more option that will display more language options if the one that you would like to see is not already displayed. Thanks so much again for joining us today. Let's go to the next slide, please. Throughout this session, uh, we really want to have as much interaction with participants as, as possible and invite you to continue sharing uh, in the Zoom chat, as we've said. Um, and we're also planning to share in the chat links and resources, inviting you to please join us in taking action to advance equality youth engagement and full participation and inclusive education for all. For participants in the US or if you have networks, colleagues, partners that are in the United States, please reach out today to urge your members of Congress to fully fund global education. We're at risk of potentially one third uh, funding cuts from US government on international basic education currently and to reauthorize the READ Act. So every voice makes a big difference. We'll provide guidance and we're always happy to give full training and give more information if you or your partners, grassroots volunteers uh, and students and the like would like to get involved. So today we're really excited to feature incredible speakers, including Himija, uh, as you can see on the screen here, as the 11th US Youth Observer to the UN. Kate is joining us from She's the First, Harley with the Education for All Coalition, and Kanisha is with the, is the has many uh, different uh, hats that she wears, but she's the youth representative of the SDG4 High Level Steering Committee. And we're looking forward to discussion and Q&A with each of you. So without further ado, we're really delighted to welcome Himija Nagaretti, the 11th US Youth Observer to the United Nations. Um, she's originally from Acton, Massachusetts, and 
the speaker bios give you and the agenda give you full details on this um, with huge thanks to our colleagues for sharing this information in the chat box. Uh, she, Himogen is the 11th Youth Observer to the UN from the US as part of the United Nations Association of the USA. In her role as Youth Observer over this year, she has been uplifting the voices and actions of young people across our country and in global policy dialogue on international issues of importance, representing young people at UN conferences, including the Transforming Education Summit or TESS, the 77th UN General Assembly or UNGA, the World Food Forum, the 27th Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC, COP27, the 67th Commission on the Status of Women, so many acronyms in our world, CSW, and the UN Water Conference and the ECOSOC Youth Forum, as well as meetings with leadership at the US State Department, the US UN Mission, UN Youth Envoy Office, UN Youth Delegate Program, and the UN Foundation. She's clearly been super busy. This year, she is also serving as the head of the US delegation to the Y20, or Youth 20, which is the official youth constituency to the G20 Summit. We are very honored to welcome you to speak with us today. Welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that really, really incredible introduction. Um, and hello to you all. It's it's such a pleasure um, to be joining you all here. Um, and just so grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit more about UNA USA um, and my role as Youth Observer um, kind of within the program. Um, but yeah, as um, a quick way of introduction into my work and the things that I've been doing, um, I also, I love to start off with the fact that I'm a pretty non-traditional person in the international relations space. My background was um, primarily focused on public health. So did my undergrad in bio, my master's in environmental health epidemiology, um, just finished up this past year serving um, as a fellow for the CDC and their agency for toxic substances and disease registry. So all in all, very different from what most people would consider um, a traditional education or professional pathway into UN related work. But I think that if anything this year has shown me and taught me, it's that having more diverse voices at the table, especially when it comes to the UN, when it comes to the advocacy for the sustainable development goals, all of that is so important to have diverse voices in, um, especially diverse youthful, youth voices um, in particular. And so that's something that I've been um, working really hard to champion. But yeah, so um, the Youth Observer, just um, to give a brief overview of what the program is about, is a one-year appointment. So anyone between the ages of 18 and 25 um, who lives in the U.S. can apply to serve as their Youth Observer. Um, it's for a term from August um, uh, from August to August, basically. And so we're actually doing, um, I was really excited um, to tell Jennifer and the team this, but we're actually doing a handoff um, to our next youth observer tomorrow. So today's essentially my last day on the job. Um, and it's really exciting to be here with you all, kind of recapping what we've done this year um, as kind of almost a way of saying goodbye. Um, in many ways, it's very bittersweet. Um, such a journey. It's truly what a greatest experience the work of lifting the voices of young people at the UN, um, primarily given the fact that a lot of U.S. youth are not engaged in the UN, even though we have so many opportunities of being engaged, right? We have UN headquarters that are right here and serving as youth, youth observer and talking to people from all across the world who have had to go through barrier after barrier with regards to visa issues, with regards to accommodation, um, just to even set foot into UN headquarters. I mean, it's shocking that we have such an opportunity here with headquarters right here in New York, but we still don't have adequate youth representation in this space um, and in these types of conferences. And so that's what our goal is really, it's really to connect the work of the UN to young people and to connect young people, especially those that are not already within the international relations space or within um, international advocacy to the work of the UN, um, to realize that we do need all voices at the table when it comes to this international advocacy and youth engagement um, is really important in fostering that and really fostering the type of local action that we need for the global change that we're talking about within the UN General Assembly walls. Um, and so as part of that work, um, it's been multifold. Um, and there are two links that um, will be in the chat shortly. One is our listening tour report. 
Um, so at the beginning of my term, what we wanted to do was we wanted to get a really in-depth look into the issues that young people care about so that we could really base a lot of our programming, a lot of the information that we were sharing on evidence that we were gathering from the ground of what young people really care about, um, the issues that are most pertinent to them at this time. Um, and so we went on this nationwide listening tour. Um, we toured 22 states in person and virtually. So I didn't actually get 22 states, um, but we were able to tour um, 22 states, um, connect with close to 2000 young people and gather their feedback for issues that mattered most to them. And in the listening tour report, um, we noted that um, a lot of issues around no poverty um, were really important for young people. Um, addressing food insecurity primarily um, was something that a lot of young people were really passionate about. Um, we also um, noted that um, other issues such as gender inequities continued to create additional barriers for young people. Climate action was noted as a huge issue um, a lot of young people are actively involved in climate activism for good reason, because a lot of young people recognize that it's not only our futures that are compromised with our degrading climate, but it's also our current, it's our today that is being compromised. Um, and so a lot of young people noted climate action um, as a huge priority and concern that they were working on. Um, and we also noted, um, as I go through the SDGs in my head, quality education. Um, and this is kind of why being here is so crucial because the work that Global Campaign for Education does is so crucial in creating coalitions that advocate for education. And that was one of the top concerns that we had heard from young people, um, that the education that they were receiving wasn't equitable, wasn't transparent, um, wasn't addressing the current needs. Um, so, for example, having a comprehensive climate education was something a lot of young people noted as a significant lack um, in their educational journeys. Um, we also noted with education um, the importance of having affordable education um, and realizing that there are still so many barriers that prevent young people um, from pursuing education, higher education um, in the topics that they really care about because of these additional barriers. Um, and not only just financial barriers, but a lot of young people that we talked to noted that they were primary care caretakers of their households and couldn't you know, see themselves um, having the opportunities that they wanted to um, because of their family situation and the lack of support that they were getting um, regardless of that. And so, all in all, quality education stood out as one of our top concerns, um, and it really ties in close to with um, our dialogue around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that we have um, an equitable, um, that we're teaching young students and that we're giving them a comprehensive education that is really embracive of the diversity of our society, um, of the people within our classroom, within our community. Um, and so all of that um, was feedback that we had gotten from young people. So we put it into a report and published it, um, shared those findings with um, our stakeholders um, and partners at the U.S. State Department, U.S. UN Mission, um, Youth Envoy's Office, and internally within UN Foundation and UNA USA. Um, because one thing that we wanted to do was really make sure that we were not only just collecting data, but we were providing pathways for taking action. And it was really in the spirit of that, Pathways for Taking Action, that we kind of launched into our spring semester of programming. Once we had completed our listening tour, we wanted to make sure that um, we were really honoring the feedback, the advice that we had gotten from young people on the issues that mattered most to them, and that we were taking action. Um, the way we decided to do that was um, in recognition that this is the um, 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, that we're celebrating this December 2023, we wanted to um, give a recognition to that, but also realize that a lot of youth rights are human rights, but are not exactly understood or codified as such within our current UN processes. Um, and so we launched this effort, a Declaration of Human Rights by American Youth Initiative, um, to really center the voices of young people um, and focus on topics that young people who did during our listening tour were predominant importance to them, things such as I mentioned, gender inequities, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, climate action, 
um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. All of those um, were topics that we themed each of these different um, nationwide development sessions on. And all of these development sessions were convened in order to gather more youth feedback and inform um, the drafting of that section for um, our draft of the Declaration of Rights by American Youth. Um, this document is meant to be a, an evidence-based um, approach to understanding the human rights that young people care about, but also give a recognition to, number one, the gaps that we have with these rights, um, and number two, the action that young people are taking right now to address them. Um, and so that's kind of why we've decided to convene these consultations, and we just wrapped up um, our ninth session, we have our 10th session today at 8 p.m. focused on gender equity. We normally feature an incredible panel of speakers, mostly youth speakers, um, and then open up the floor to the consultation part. And Kate, um, who's on this call, um, has been such a huge supporter of this initiative and just so grateful to you, Kate, um, for being there along the entire way. Um, but yeah, so we're convening that um, today on gender um, equity and then our last consultation on the 17th will be a final consultation before we then go into the drafting um, of it and then um, the final release of this declaration by, um, by the 75th anniversary of when UDHR was first published. Um, and so that's a little bit about what we've been doing, um, but I will end and I've been speaking for a long time, so happy to take questions afterwards. But I will end with saying that the most gratifying thing of this entire Youth Observer experience has been hearing the stories of young people and being able to honor those stories. Um, we've had young people be so brave about their experiences um, in the family court system. We've had young people talk about how environmental injustices have personally affected their health and well-being and how they're champions for climate action because they never want anyone else's futures to be compromised the way their futures were compromised. Um, we've had young people talk about how the educational system actively discriminated against them. And that's why they're such huge champions for equitable education, because they believe everyone should have a right to the education that they deserve, to the economic opportunity that we all need um, for that just future. Um, and so it's been so eye-opening and inspiring and Honestly, every time I talk, I, every time I talk about it, I do get a little choked up because it really has been one of the most, um, the, the most inspiring parts of my job has been to be able to meet just incredible, incredible young people, incredible youth activists who are doing the work that we're talking about, um, who are actively um, looking for support um, and organizations such as yours and this coalition um, that um, is convened through um, Global Campaign for Education, all of the work that you do. Um, plays such a crucial role in continuing to support the youth activists um, that are on the grounds that are doing this type of work um, that we need for that equitable future that we talk about. Um, so we can't ever think about doing this work without them. And 2030, we talk about the sustainable development goals, 2030 is right around the corner. Quality education, as we know, has been significantly impacted. A lot of our progress has actually been backtracked because of COVID-19. And so continuing to support our youth advocates on the ground um, is so fundamental, especially because they're the ones that are most proximal to many of these issues, including issues around education. Um, so I will end it there, but happy to answer any questions and, and thank you for giving me the floor. I'm just so appreciate being in the space with you all. This is amazing. You've covered so much and we're really excited. Um, and congratulate you on a jam-packed year. And we appreciate you helping to introduce the community uh, to get even more engaged um, with, with this August handoff. Uh, we have shared a couple of these resources in the chat box. And um, it looks like at least one question has come in, thanks to Mark Engman. Um, he says, would love to hear about you, uh, about how you talk about child rights in the U.S., given the U.S. status as on the only country in the world not a party to the CRC on child rights, um, especially given the increasing focus on, quote, parental rights, end quote, without any consideration of child rights. I'm sure this issue has, has come up during your very busy year. Um, and if others have questions, please do share them in the chat box. 
Any thoughts on that that you'd like to share? Uh, back it's to such a good question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for raising it. Um, and it's, it is it is a very important question. I will say that um, a lot of our advocacy focuses on what the UN is championing, at least from like my youth observer standpoint. Um, and so for me, like that's something that um, I've been trying to raise more awareness of through things like social media, um, but it is a huge gap. Um, and it is something that, um, you know, I hope that our administration does um, take more action on, especially because um, the rights of the child are really important. Um, I was speaking and I alluded to this before briefly, um, but one of our, during one of our listening sessions, we had um, an incredible young person uh, speak up about her experiences in the family court system um, and how um, she was abused by um, our legal system that didn't take her rights, her voice, her preferences, um, her testimony into adequate consideration um, and was thus forced to go back to live with her abusive father, um, even though she had mentioned on multiple occasions that this was a concern and her mom had as well. Um, so that was just one example um, that was brought up, but um, she's such a huge champion. We actually were able to feature her um, for one of her um, posts on social media um, and also included a few links that she had kindly shared with us to also um, refer people to on advocacy that's currently being done um, to legalize um, substantially uh, better the rights of um, children, um, especially in the legal system. But you're right. I mean, internationally, there are still so many gaps in the UN and the US, I should say, um, has yet to um, adhere um, and sign on to the commitments that many of the other member states of the UN had when it comes to protecting the rights of children. Thank you for such amazing examples and for all of your work. If there's more that you'd like to share, um, just let us know. Uh, and um, we're really excited uh, that you can all see that um, Himaj is literally on tour and, and, on, and moving so fast. So we're grateful to you for taking time to share with us today. If there are for all speakers and all participants today, if there are things coming up for International Youth Day this Saturday, the 12th of August, um, and then also key action points later this month going into September for UN General Assembly, the SDG Summit and the like, please do share. Um, we've heard from a few colleagues that there might be some calendars coming together but haven't seen anything truly substantive quite yet, it's still August 10th. Um, but I know uh, people are always trying to be prepared. Um, so also advice and you know reflections are always welcome for what we can do to, to be even better um, at uh, this advocacy and this collaboration and, and really paving the space for, um, for all youth and children to be at the table with policymakers. So uh, please join us in a big round of applause uh, for Himaj's amazing work. Um, I'm going to pass to our, our colleague Maha to introduce our next speaker. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jennifer. And thank you so much, Himaja, for your wonderful presentation and all your amazing work. Um, next, we would like to introduce our incredible second speaker, Kate Lord from She's the First. Kate is the Director of Advocacy and Communications at She's the First, which is a nonprofit that teams up with grassroots leaders to make sure girls everywhere are educated, respected, and heard. She oversees the organization's activism programming for girls, which includes the Global Girls Bill of Rights workshops and the STF campus, which is a network of high school, college, and university students all around the globe fighting for girls' rights. After a decade as a photojournalist, Kate's interest in the intersection of storytelling, advocacy, and ethics has led her to academia. We welcome you, Kate. Thank you so much for being with us here today, and over to you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Maha, and thank you, um, Humaja. That was a wonderful presentation and, and really led into uh, what I'm going to talk about beautifully because um, as she's the first, we're all about um, listening to girls, listening to students, and um, amplifying what they have to say and centering their voices in what um, they think that 
needs to happen to um, enable them to choose their own futures. Um, if we could move forward to the next slide, please. Sorry if it's frozen. Dana, just let us know if we can help at all. There we go. Excellent. Your patience. Thank you. um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about one of our initiatives, which is called the Global Girls Bill of Rights. And we can actually move on to the next one. I'm going to first talk a little bit about She's the First. Thank you so much, uh, which is the organization I work for. Um, as Maha said, we are a Global Girls Rights organization. We fight for a world where every girl can choose her own future. Um, we do that by teaming up with grassroots leaders to make sure that girls everywhere are educated, respected, and heard. These Who are these leaders? They are women running programs for girls in oppressed communities from rural Kenya to um, mountain valleys in Peru to remote towns in India. There are also girls who are organizing their peers in their area to stand up for their rights, such as hosting a demonstration in Nepal or producing a reproductive arts show um, in New York City and Nairobi, which I will tell you about uh, in a little bit. Um, and um, a young girl who's uh, leading an, a farm project to raise funds for her fellow girls to attend school with her in Uganda. Um, and we've been around for 13 years. We created transformational outcomes for more than 226,000 girls and 285 community organizations in 42 countries. We do this through teaching girls to speak up for themselves in her schools, homes, and communities. But we also teach the mentors in her life how to, in her life how to practical ways to support her agency. Um, and this way, girls become the first women in their families to achieve amazing milestones. And we do that um, through three ways, activism trainings for girls, um, which is one of the programs that I lead. Uh, but we also do that through med supporting mentorship and education programs through community-based organizations that we partner with and through organizational strengthening. And I'm going to just share some links for you in the chat for you to check out. So all of these resources and programs are free. Um, our activism programs for girls, you can find in these links to share with girls in your programs and lives for them to check out. And then free resources and trainings for community-based organizations. These are professional development trainings and resources for people who work in community-based organizations with girls. Check them out, see if they're of interest to you. Uh, my colleagues uh, who work uh, out of our Nairobi office develop and create these. Um, and they are um, about girl-centered design, feminist mentorship, um, all the things that really strengthen programs that help girls be able to choose their own future. So today, if we can move to the next slide, please, we I'm going to talk about one of our initiatives called the Global Girls Bill of Rights. Um, which in 2019, we partnered with our um, community-based organization partners, Achille Dada, which is in Nairobi, Kenya, and Maya, which is in um, Solala, Guatemala, um, to reach out to girls all over the world um, to ask them, what do they think their key rights are that um, they may or may not be experiencing in their daily lives? And we had more than a thousand girls submit rights that they thought they should be experiencing from 34 countries. Um, and then uh, you can see some pictures of the girls here. Uh, after all of these girls submitted their rights, um, on the next slide, yep, right here, we will see that 15 girl activists from around the world took these thousands of submissions. And they, with the support from our staff, we what they the girls chose and put them into 10 they narrowed them down they wrote the final 10 rights and they built this which is the global girls bill of rights which i will now put in the chat um and then in 2019 international day of the girl on the next slide you will see that they presented it to the un to the deputy secretary general of the united nations at the time Ms. amina J. muhammad as well as on the next slide, the then executive director of the UN, of UN Women, Ms. Fumzile Malambo, I always said this wrong, I'm so sorry, in Kuka. Um, and then of course, COVID hit. <laughs> we had all these big plans to help the girls amplify their rights and what they wanted to do. Um, and so, but yet, even despite COVID, um, Girls did amazing things. Girls have done over the past five years, nearly five years, 
a lot with the Global Girls Bill of Rights. So, but before I go into what girls have achieved and what girls have um, done at activism wise, let's talk about what rights they landed on. What did they decide as the 10 things most important for them to experience? So we'll flip through the 10. Oh yes, and I wanted to say that when it launched in 2019, uh, over 150 million people around the world saw it. Uh, NPR covered it, uh, a bunch of magazines and newspapers covered it. Um, so a lot of people saw it and then COVID hit. <laughs> so uh, yes, we'll go and what is it? What is the Global Girls Bill of Rights? Uh, so we will start going through them. I have a slide for each one. Number one thing girls said is that all girls have the right to free quality education, which prepares them for the modern world, which this group should all agree with, right? Um, and then the rest, I think you will also agree with because they are all things that genuinely tend to impact whether or not girls uh, have um, the ability to have, have this education. So let's see what the next rest are. Number two is equality, free from discrimination and stereotypes. Number three, whoops, oh, there we go. Um, to be involved in decision-making and pursue leadership opportunities and positions. Documentation recognized by relevant authorities. The right to comprehensive sexual education and access to quality reproductive health care. To be protected from harmful traditions and enjoy positive cultural practices. The right to be safe from all forms of violence in all locations the right to make decisions about their body and sexuality, the right to be protected under the law without fear of unequal fear or unequal treatment, and to be free from exploitation, safe from child labor, trafficking, and early marriage. So next year, 2024, is going to be the fifth anniversary of the Global Girls Bill of Rights. Um, when the girls, so the girls created it, then 15 girls made it into the 10 rights. And then our team built this free toolkit, which I have here, which you'll find at that link, the global girls Bill of rights .org. You can go, there's a link on there to this free toolkit, girls can download. Um, and there's a bunch of activities to give them ideas of ways that they can take action in their communities um, to talk about their rights. Um, we found that girls use this as a way to sometimes it's hard to pinpoint. You can like feel like something is happening in your world, in your life. That's like, ah, this doesn't feel quite right. But sometimes girls say to us that they, that the this document helps them pinpoint like, yeah, I have rights. And this, this thing that's happening is not right because, you know, I have a right to equality or I have a right to safety from violence or I have a right to um, decision making about my body and like this this gives them a lens and and the words to be able to start that conversation and be able to to start to to say what it is that felt wrong about something that was happening in their lives um so there's a toolkit to to help with your mentorship sessions or with the girls themselves can start with that so um, I think I only have a few more minutes, so I'm so sorry. I'll go to the next slide. I also wanna show just a couple of the activism things girls themselves have done inspired by the Bill of Rights. Um, these are just a quick few things. You can see girls have done social media, girls have written poems. And then I'll just go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a really big one I'm excited about. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a group, um, a community-based organization to worked together, uh, Colors of Connection, uh, worked with Tulizu El Stas DRC. I know I said that wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, but they painted, They girls came up with a local girl, global, global, local girls bill of rights, inspired by the global girls bill of rights. And then they painted three big murals in their village, big, to start local conversations. So people have to see it. Locals have to see it, people have to see it, and then they have to have conversations about it, um, which has been, had a big impact. Um, and people are talking about it. And then things are starting to change because every day people have to see and talk about the rights that girls need to experience in this, um, in this village, which is so cool. Um, and then on the next slide, 
Um, this is, um, we have a program called, uh, right now it's called the Youth Ambassadors, but we're changing the name to the Girl Activist Fellowship. And this year they did a campaign called The Power of Poetry Inspired by Girls' Right to Education. And this young woman um, is a graduate of um, a community-based organization in Nepal. Um, and she is a poet and uh, she wrote this poem about her, her education. And so I just like to play it real quick. Of course, we tested this and it did have sound earlier, but unfortunately the sound's not coming through. My right. grandmother learned her first letter at 65. Mm -hmm. I remember her strive to write her name, thinking about how signing her name instead of a thumbprint would be a changed game for her. I remember her eyes beaming with pride as she tried to remember what the word looks like and what they sound like, and I couldn't be happier for her. My mother was married off in ninth grade. The exchange of her education with house was possible responsibility was not a fair trade. Reading and writing Nepali, no big deal, but English is the real deal. My mother cannot understand my English poem, and it has become a norm for her to ask me for a translation. But she is learning English. The word probably sounds rubbish to her, but she is learning. And even if she does not like to believe, at the age of 15, she is growing. She recently learned to post her comments on social medias, and she needs nobody's help. Sometimes she may comments beautiful instead of beautiful under my picture, but I know what she meant, and I am proud of her. For me, I love learning maths and sciences. I love to read poems and stories in Nepali and English. I am amazed to learn how our body works in perfect coordination, how this earth works, how this universe works. And thanks to the education that I have received, I learned about the moon and the sky and the ants and the flies and the hearts and the brain and men and women, and the rock and the mountain and the river and the sea, and also about you and me. And I also learned that maybe you aren't as blessed as me and that makes me feel a little bit guilty and a little bit greedy for not being able to share everything that I have learned so far. And I feel angry that sometimes those who can choose not to. And I hope all of us would someday learn about this amazing world and amazing people. I hope all of us will learn and grow, not just academically, but also as a person. We will learn to be kinder and braver and the world would really be this amazing place that I believe it is. Thank you. So Lisa was a graduate of one of, she's the first partner organizations in Nepal um, that we've worked with over the years. Um, and she just started medical school this year. So she was in our activist, she was part in our partner organization, graduated from this community-based organization. And as you heard her say, her mother and her grandmother didn't finish school. She's the first in her family, first girl in her family to finish high school and now she's in medical school which is amazing um yeah and she then she was in this girl activism program and helped launch this poetry campaign inspired by the girls bill of rights um which amanda gorman shared and amanda gorman shared her poem and was really impressed by it um which was super exciting then hundreds of thousands of people saw that campaign and um then became inspired to help um and and uh, help she's the first to um further girls education so um that was really awesome. Um, another campaign inspired by the Girls' Bill of Rights, a flash mob protest in Nepal. This is another young lady from Nepal from that same program. Um, she went into her village on market day and kind of just in the middle had a flash mob to talk about rape culture and made everybody listen to her, made everybody listen to her voice, um, which was awesome. And then, sorry, next one. I know I'm running out of time. I don't want to take up too much more time. See, a young woman from Indiana um, started with a post on our Instagram about uh, safety from gun violence in schools, inspired by number seven. And then the uh, seeing the impact of that inspired her to have a school assembly in her school, and that inspired her to have a letter writing campaign to her um, representatives in Indiana. And then uh, we helped her to write a op-ed that got the interest of USA Today. Um, and so a lot more people are seeing, hearing her voice and hearing her talk about this issue that's important to her. Um, so right now, just being able to what you can do, oops, sorry, back one more for me, please. 
There we go. What 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 are they doing right now? The girls in our program right now are working on for Day of the Girl, which is October 11th. Um, inspired by the Girls' Bill of Rights, number five, they access to free quality reproductive health care and comprehensive sex ed. They have decided they want to do a art contest by girls for girls inspired by the theme, My Body, My Choice. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat off girl artists can, uh, they can put their art in. This says August 15th is the deadline. We're probably going to extend it to September 1st, but we're saying August 15th right now, but um, and yeah, so there's going to be an actual live in two art shows, one in New York City and one in Nairobi, Kenya. And we have a panel of girls and artists working together to choose the art that's going to show up in both places. But all of the artwork that lives up to our values of being girl-centered and anti-oppressive will be on our website. Um, yes, we'd love to see girls from your programs participate if you'd like to um, and elevate their voices about this important issue. Um, sorry, now you may move on to the next slide. So yes, this is the Global Girls Bill of Rights. More ways you can get involved is uh, next year, 2024, is the fifth anniversary. We're going to be looking for organizations to put their stamp of approval on it. If you feel like this is something that you, your organization aligns with your values, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, my uh, contact info is at the end of this. We're looking for organizations to say, yes, we agree, um, to share the toolkit with your girls. Um, and we'd love to talk to you and work with you for our fifth anniversary next year to, to really amplify the girls' voices about this and their rights and their needs, especially. I think we all agree again on number one. So thank you so much. And I'd love to answer any questions. This is amazing. You have a few questions, Kate, and I'll mention them quickly from the chat. And, and then maybe if you wanna take a minute to kind of share reflections, but, um, and then we can continue sharing ideas in the chat box, if that's okay. Yeah. You um, have are doing so much and it's, uh, you know, sparking lots of fantastic questions and ideas. First question, what is being done to help girls in Afghanistan? And I don't know if she's the first is, is active in that area. So please, everybody is welcome to chime in um, with thanks to um, our colleague Maha and others who have also been quite active in this space, knowing, knowing that it's extremely challenging. Uh, Peter Kayanga also asked what programs um, might be available for disabled girls in Uganda. Um, lots of fantastic uh, feedback about what a great initiative this is. And Kelvin asked, what activities are you specifically conducting to achieve target number three, which maybe was a, a previous campaign or might be a, a new one coming up. So any quick reflections would be great. And then we can continue to provide, um, share ideas in the chat box. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. So um, to answer about target number three, I believe you're, you're talking about uh, involvement in decision-making, the, the number three from the Girls' Bill of Rights. Um, for us in our activism for girls programming, that a lot of that, we talk a lot about um, what you can do to have leadership and, and building up your confidence and skills so that you can go back to your local communities and speak up and take action and try to break into those spaces. Um, because a lot of our training is about going back to your local community and and taking what we teach you and going back to your local community and and making the, and doing that there. It's also we provide leadership positions in, within She's the First. So at She's the First, we actually have a girls advisory council that um, is a group of uh, like 50 girls from around the world who for all of our programming, once a month we go and we talk to them and make sure that all of our programming is girl centered. We also have two girls from that council are on our board. So they are our bosses. They're my CEO's boss. Um, so we have some real girls in positions of power um, at our organization. So I hope that helps answer that question. Um, for the question about Afghanistan, we in our partner coalition do not currently work in Afghanistan. Uh, we have something, if you go to that link I shared uh, called the Girls First Network, which is a network of community-based organizations all around the world where they can talk to each other and we provide resources and um, trainings, every, things we hear about outs our trainings, but also things we hear about anywhere in the, in the world that would help for girl-centered organizations. So there are some organizations in there that are uh, working in Afghanistan. And as um, Jennifer said, uh, it is a very difficult place to work right now. So if anybody wants to chime in and talk about that, 
for Uganda. Um, we do work in Uganda. We have a partner there that we've worked with for a very long time. Uh, it's called Arlington Academy of Hope. It's in uh, Baduda District in Bumalakani. Um, and they do work with um, some students who um, have disabilities. Um, and I'm happy to talk more with you in depth there about that, but also um, we're happy to have you, if you add something that you work on, join our Girls First Network and um, work more with us there. Um, but if somebody would like, who does do a lot more work in Afghanistan would like to chime in, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Amazing, thank you so very much for all that you're doing and real great opportunity even just today from building some st even stronger linkages and partnerships and, and going forward. So thank you, Kate. Thanks to everybody with She's the First. Over to our colleague, Dana. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing your amazing work. Next, we'd like to introduce Harley from the Education for All Coalition. Harley Pomper is a master's student in anthropology and a Franklin Research Fellow at the University of Chicago, USA, working to empower access to education for undeserved, disabled, and incarcerated students. From climate resilience curriculum to trauma responsive training for educators, Pomper is devoted to creating equitable, just, and compassionate learning environments rooted in community care. So without further ado, Harley, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me take a second to share my screen. Hold on, just give me one moment. Appreciate your patience here. <laughs> okay. Hopefully everyone can see this. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Um, well, hello, everyone. It's great to meet you all. Uh, my name is Charlie Pomper, um, and I'm presenting on disability and climate justice for displaced children. Um, so disabled people of all ages are and forever will be disproportionately affected uh, by climate change. Um, as this quote illustrates, uh, disabled people are at greater risk of harm from the practical effects of climate change, such as natural disaster. Um, but climate change can also be disabling in itself for individuals because of the broader implications of trauma and grief for the body and mind, especially among children. So it's critical to understand um, disability and trauma as inseparable from one another. Um, and thinking the definition of both of these terms um, expansively uh, will allow for more creative and effective practice. So we're thinking about trauma and grief in the context of disability as it relates to psychosocial impacts, physical embodiment, all of these different things, caregiving, right? This is a pretty broad definition. So uh, a main goal um, of my research with Dr. Rose Carrelli, who's on this call as well, um, has, been to has been to synthesize a more holistic model for climate resilience and vulnerability that includes psychosocial factors alongside more commonly acknowledged systemic forces. So we've chosen to focus on climate migration because of its relevance to trauma, grief, and place-based education. So to simplify this model a little further, because I know that there's a lot on the screen, um, uh, we wanted to illustrate some, though of course not all, of the forces for change when it comes to climate migration. So hopefully some of you see yourselves represented in these different sectors here. Um, so I'm going to move on with that context um, to understanding climate trauma. Uh, this definition is expansive and ever-changing. Um, climate and migration trauma commonly coexist. Uh, climate trauma can also be incurred in the anticipation of a disaster um, or amidst slow onset climate events. Uh, so sometimes that's referred to as pre-traumatic stress or even for some as ego anxiety. Um, it can also emerge from secondary effects like cultural loss or disrupted education as a result of climate change. So I wanna raise uh, that vulnerabilities and resiliencies can exist in the same populations, um, and that the same factors that make a community vulnerable can also make them resilient. Um, and finally, that research, lived experience, and policy can coexist to tell a more complete story. Um, all of this is especially true uh, in disabled communities, wherein our vulnerabilities are also our sources of strength if given appropriate support. Um, and lived experience is crucial uh, when it comes to trauma and disability, not only because disabled voices are often marginalized and erased, um, but also because these are embodiments that are difficult to capture in research or policy. So I'm going to move into summarizing climate trauma here through SAMHSA's three E's. 
Um, and hopefully it's, hold on. Hopefully it's clear um, why you know this this conversation about trauma is connected to one about disability. Um, so first, the consequences of climate change can range and reach from a single mudslide uh, to heat waves across several continents. And these are not single traumatic events, but rather sets of risk factors that increase a child's potential exposure to traumatic situations and exacerbate existing social harms. So the emotional strains of migration, climate change, and disaster are fairly intuitive in some cases, right? Like research, uh, resource uh, scarcity, housing instability, familial death. Um, these are all profound sources of trauma um, for children. Um, but climate and migration trauma can also emerge from less immediate and tangible sources as well, um, in part because the decision to leave is often bound up in broader historical and cultural traumas. So next for experience, um, I wanna quote uh, Zewa Woodbury um, who writes, Climate trauma is continually triggering all past traumas, personal, cultural, and intergenerational, and will continue to do so until at such time as it is acknowledged. Um, while all of us will be in some way touched by this global process, every person is differently shielded from or vulnerable to its consequences, whether by physical location, governmental status, race, class, disability, and more. Um, and these differences fracture a collective experience of climate change. Um, the risk of trauma leaving a profound negative effect on a child depends almost completely on their individual circumstances, particularly their position in society, their family's psychosocial health, uh, and their access to support. And disability and trauma, of course, inform a child's societal position, family's well-being, and access to, to support. So these are really cyclical processes. And finally, for effects, any event or circumstance that an individual experiences as harmful and that impacts their future well-being can create trauma. Um, effects can be mitigated or intensified depending on the family, community, and society a child is embedded in. And these effects can devastate physical and mental health, social development, learning, environmental identity, and more. So for healing, <laughs> um, trauma as a life process extends far past a single moment. And even the discrete categories of events, experiences, and effects, um, you know, these are not all inclusive necessarily. Um, and this is true for healing. Inside and outside of institutions, uh, trauma survivors and disabled people um, find ways to heal. Uh, people can participate in both individual and community healing, such as local outreach, religion, advocacy, um, and other spaces of belonging, like education too. Um, and access to these spaces can ease psychological adjustment uh, and help people of all ages construct meaning from their experiences. So this is why the idea of access is so vital for disabled children. Um, proactive environmental education can also help to soften the shock of climate change. Uh, and I want to stress the links not only between trauma and disability, but between these two concepts and the environment. Um, Western epistemologies, I have to say, uh, have also always neglected indigenous non-white ways of knowing, being, and healing, um, which often include activism and justice. Um, participation in disability and environmental justice movements, um, local science, uh, and bottom-up policies are part of healing from trauma because they build solidarity, community, and agency. And these are critical protections against climate risk. So I hope to present here a version of disabled healing that is not about cure or treatment, but rather about self-discovery, community learning, and accommodation. So disability provides just one lens uh, for how to understand the impact of climate and migration on the individual's body, mind, and environment. And though there are many viable ways to understand this crisis, I believe that disability justice in particular um, provides incredibly valuable insight uh, into what it means to survive in a world that is not built for or necessarily even compatible with um, how we typically exist. So um, this is where, uh, you know, the social model of disability comes in, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so traumatic experiences, events, and effects can themselves constitute disability, but ultimately the reality of disabled people is dependent on how we are treated by our community, our institutions, the government, and our environment. Uh, and that's where the social model of disability becomes really important. Um, it poses that disability is not inherently bad, um, but just a mode of existence that can be negotiated by accommodation. Um, and you'll notice that I've been saying uh, disabled people rather than people with disabilities, because it can be more helpful to understand uh, disability as a socially mediated process rather than a medical fact. Um, I might be considered disabled in the US only because I have access to diagnosis or because the US has a particular conception of trauma and disability or because I am currently protected um, from some forms of climate trauma. 
Um, and similarly, the neurodiversity movement um, poses that people's brains function in complementary ways that should be supported, included, and valued. So these are really sort of foundational um, principles for how we approach disability justice in policy. So on a structural level, um, it's critical to understand these three facts, even though there is, you know, sometimes some contradiction. Um, oppression and uh, climate change, trauma, these can all be disabling, and we have to fight against the societal injustice and violence that drives them. And at the same time, disability itself is not a problem to be solved. Um, it's a fact of life. It's an opportunity for joy, um, for community, and for collective care. So I want to take a second to look at the principles. Uh, these are just a few principles um, of disability justice. Uh, but there's a lot of crossover between sort of typical policy language uh, in terms of vulnerabilities and resiliencies. And I think it's, it's critical to see um, where there's room for growth in terms of how we approach the intersection of these concepts, um, if you just want to take a second to look, look at it. Um, and to clarify from my perspective, for policymakers, I think there are two central takeaways here. Um, first, that disability should be integrated with other movements to center marginalized voices rather than siloed, as it often is. Um, disability is intersectional with every other mode of marginalization. Uh, and we all have bodies and brains, uh, to my knowledge. Um, so by extension, we will all experience uh, some degree of disability in our lifespans. And this experience will only become more common and more significant in an era of climate migration. So our policies need to be prepared in terms of scope, vocabulary, and how we approach lived experience. And second, that education is an incredible opportunity uh, for not only creating more awareness and accommodation, but promoting long-term aims of disability justice. Education needs to incorporate disability and trauma curricula that better enable um, children to understand themselves, each other, and their social and natural environments. So I also want to call for support for networks like Sustained Ability, um, which is a UN-affiliated organization, um, and that empowers disabled-led leadership in the climate crisis. So I'm going to close out by presenting um, a few pages of a video that I hope kind of embodies some of these ideas. Um, this is something I put together with the Education for All Coalition, which educates children about environmental processes, while also using those processes as metaphors for SEL concepts. So the zine was uh, written with disability in mind, um, as it prepares students to empathize with and accommodate disabled individuals through community action, while also recognizing their own ties to the disabled community. So we've also prepared a teacher's guide that more explicitly brings out these themes uh, in the context of disability. Um, just to highlight a couple pages, uh, the first is about uh, understanding vulnerability and recognizing when people need support. Um, the second teaches uh, children how to ask for support um, from their communities. And then the third gets children thinking about long-term social transformation. Um, and these themes of accommodation and transformation are critical to a future where we see disability justice as necessary for survival. Um, it's not hard to incorporate these themes, right? These are critical and, and these are really core to what SEL means to us in our everyday lives. Um, and disability and trauma can be brought into that um, both explicitly and implicitly, uh, I think to great effect. So finally, I want to uh, plug our book coming out soon on climate migration, trauma, and education. Um, I'd really love to connect with all of you. Uh, this has been such a wonderful opportunity and I'm so grateful. So thanks everyone. I can stop screen sharing if that's useful. <laughs> what is easy? Okay, I'll stop sharing. Thank, thank you so very much. That's, that's amazing. And we're really looking forward uh, grateful to you, to Rose, to everybody working on this exciting new resource and book. Um, there are a few questions in the chat, um, if time allows, um, but lots of um, applause. Uh, and, um, you know, thanks to Peter Kayanga for, for mentioning the challenge, you know, for those of us with disabilities, um, and and in, in this case, you know, an example of um, Peter says, I have a disability and climate project um, awareness undone due to finance. Um, you know, so any of you've already mentioned some ideas in terms of help, right? Um, and so it sounds like, you know, that um, any additional resources that would be helpful for people at not just global and community, but individual levels. Um, would be would be really especially welcome. Thank you.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think sustainability is a great network, um, and I, I'm not totally sure how they work with sort of emerging community organizations, but that might be something to look into. Um, I would also say, you know, disabled people always rely, like we, we rely on our own communities to support us um, and to give us that sort of mutual aid, right? Like that's a, that's a huge part of what this process looks like. So if there is any sort of community outreach you can do, I think that that's often central to how we survive in the world. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not aware of any sort of specific organizations that offer, um, it, it seems like you're maybe looking for financial support for your work. Um, so I'm not totally sure about that, but if anybody has an, any other ideas, I, I would love to hear about them personally as well uh, in the chat. Thank you. And do you mind, is it possible to answer the, uh, share your slides in the chat and also um, answer the, the questions that are popping up now? Um, thanks to Kelvin and, and others for sharing ideas as well as questions. We're so grateful to you, Harley. And just passing to my colleague, uh, Kate, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for these wonderful remarks and this and such an important discussion. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for your time today and for sharing all of your wonderful work. So next, we would like to introduce Kanisha Aurora, Youth Representative with the SDG High Level Steering Committee. Kanisha Aurora um, is a Youth Representative of the SDG 4 High Level Steering Committee, Chair of the Student Senate at Western University, and co-founder of the Hope Sisters nonprofit. As the elected youth representative for North America and Europe, Kanisha is the youngest member of UNESCO's SDG4 High Level Steering Committee, working alongside the member states and ministers across the world to transform education worldwide. As the executive of UNESCO's Youth Network, she also leads a network of 100 education activists across the world to provide quality education to all young people. Welcome, Kanisha, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so great to hear from Kate and um, Hillary as well. It's really inspiring to know that there's so many people out there working, you know, to transform education worldwide. Um, if I may, I'd love to share my screen. Yes, apologies. Let's just make sure that um, if our host could make you a co-host, Dana, thank you. That would be really helpful. There we go. See, that's why we need a digital transformation in education. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Well, um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to share with you my journey into what we call transforming education, but I'm someone who is studying medical sciences. I am in my undergraduate degree at Canada, and I never really thought that, you know, being passionate about medicine, one day I'd be talking to you all about why we need to transform education and, and, you know, what that even looks like. So how exactly did I get here? Well, for me, my education journey really began when I was elected as a school board trustee in the greater Toronto area, and I had the very privilege of representing 250,000 children um, from all grades in education. So this for me really was a pivotal moment in getting to understand the experiences of young people around my community. And um, to my surprise, I learned about period poverty very early on. You know, growing up in Canada, um, my parents came to this country to give me a lot of privilege of accessing quality education. So I never thought one day that I would have to learn about some of the horrific effects of inequities in our system. But my best friend dropped out of high school because of the inaccessibility of menstrual hygiene products. And that to me was a big shock. And that's when I took the opportunity to learn about what period poverty even meant. And to our surprise in Canada, one in seven girls actually miss school because of this inaccessibility. So of course I knew there was a stigma in our society. I remember the times when we were forced to, you know, hide the pads and products underneath our shirts so the boys wouldn't make certain remarks. But I never thought something like a stigma could be an even bigger barrier in our system. And that's when I learned that systematic change was gonna be crucial in the work that I was gonna do in the future. So I put forth a motion to provide free menstrual hygiene products in our school washrooms. 
But of course, the moment I talked about this, our board said that we're not allowed to talk about this stuff in our public board meeting because of the stigma around menstruation. So it was immediately removed from the table. And since then, um, I took the time, you know, of course, I was really disheartened, but I thought about it and I said, okay, it's really easy for me to just give up because, you know, I, we're not allowed to talk about it in our system, in our board. But is this a time for me to give up or is it a time for us to amplify the voices of all the menstruators who are not able to access education, even in one of the most privileged countries of the world? So that's what I did. I stood up, I, I mustered up some courage, and for eight months, I knocked on the door even when people would not listen. And after eight months, I'm proud to say that I was able to make this motion um, be passed in our board. And even beyond that, I took it as an opportunity to work with our Ministry of Education to do the same for all school boards. But this was just at our you know, country level. What about globally? Um, well, with my nonprofit organization called the Hope Sisters, we wanted to take this as an opportunity to provide girls all over the world with access to education. And so um, we have 50 chapters across the world, but we just started a chapter in Bogota, Liberia, where girls, um, this is a photo of a school, girls are not allowed to go to school. And it's because families there only have a small a subsect of financial um, um, you know, opportunity to provide that for their sons. So for whatever financial resources they have, they give it to their sons to go to school. And they don't believe in the empowerment of you know, girls, but even if they had the financial means, um, they, the girls wouldn't have the opportunity. So what we did was one, try to break down this you know, um, menstrual inequity for, for the young girls who do wanna go to school, but we're also providing them with educational opportunities through our hope bags. So you can see photos of our hope bags here. Um, and each hope bag has an educational STEM kit, an art kit, or um, books that they can read as well. And we organize virtual workshops with these girls so that they can learn. And then if they have any inequities or you know, barriers to access that education, we provide them with the, the menstrual support that they need. But now how do we take such a small project and move it globally? How can we transform education worldwide? And why should we? Well, my organization is just one of the works that are, you know, one of the youth-led organizations that are doing work at the ground. But globally, there are still 244 million children worldwide who are out of school. That's a huge gap, a huge gap that we still have to address. And it's not only 244 million children that are out of school, but it's 244 million children that could be the future doctors curing cancer, that could be the janitors keeping our floors clean, that could be the next you know, creators of a solution to climate change. But this is what we're doing by not providing these children the access to education. So that's why I'm very passionate about this global education movement that we're championing at UNESCO and with all the other UN agencies. So what we're doing is um, building this movement called Transforming Education. And this was a summit that we organized at the UN um, Assembly last year. And it basically, at the Assembly, we had the privilege of launching a youth declaration alongside Secretary General Antonio Guterres. And this youth declaration was quite pivotal because it united the voices of almost half a million young people. And it clearly indicated the needs to transform education. It indicated the need to have climate literacy in our school systems, the need for financial literacy to empower girls and children worldwide to be financially free. It highlighted the need for including indigenous voices in our school systems. It highlighted the need for really including leadership opportunities for young people to take charge of what they're learning and not only be a part of the system or not only be beneficiaries. So we launched this huge declaration and it was quite amazing. We got um, the UN Youth Envoys Office to lead this as well. But now what? You know, we launched a declaration, we have clear recommendations, and we took the we took charge at this conference, but it still wasn't enough. And we still need to do more for youth engagement. Because after the commitments that came back from the leaders of the summit, we realized that one in five countries referenced youth engagement in general. One in seven countries recognize young people as being important players and not only beneficiaries. And only one in seven therefore had these consultations with young people. But one in 10 countries actually talked about involving young people in policy reform or school governance. And that right there is a great issue because 
If you don't have means for active youth engagement, how will you know that you know, young girls are missing school because of the inaccessibility of menstrual hygiene products? Imagine how many of my friends out there in the world are not able to voice their concerns or pass a motion that they believe will you know, allow them to access education if they don't even have a seat at the table. And that's why we've launched the Global Youth Initiative. And this Global Youth Initiative focuses on three pillars, with youth, by youth, and for youth. And we are launching this with the UNESCO Youth Network that I have the privilege of um, you know, being an executive of and leading. But this network is really focused on how do we transform education at the grassroots levels, at the community level, at the national level, and at the global level with youth, by youth, and for youth. And so the way that we are doing it is kind of complex, but there's three main overview arching um, like areas. The first theme being youth empowerment and leadership, allowing young people to get a seat at the table um, and be able to voice their concerns at the school level, their ministries, and even globally through our network, but then also prepare them to policy negotiate. I remember when I first put that motion on the table, I didn't think I was going to get a no because how could you say no to allowing more girls to access education. So it was beyond me that I would have to negotiate the policy that I was putting forward. But that's why we need to negotiate and teach young people how to negotiate policy. So a big part of the Global Youth Initiative is not only empowering young people to get a seat at the table, but figure out a way to create meaningful impact with the voice that, and privilege that they've been given. And the second part is around participation, getting young people to hold political leaders accountable. We've seen just how great of a force we can be. I mean, not only with the youth declaration about how we've been able to unite so many young leaders, but young people, we're at the forefront of the climate movement of the health movement. We were the ones who empowered everyone to stay home during COVID. We're the ones who are empowering people to think differently about their climate choices. We are the ones who are dismantling stigmas socially. And I think that really shows how we have a great opportunity to hold political leaders accountable. And you know, I really believe that education can only be a political importance once we make it a public importance. So that's why us young people need to mobilize each other to believe in education being a public priority. And then third of all, leading global um, education movements. So um, at the grassroots level, we've been able to do this with uh, all of our um, you know, members that we have in our network. And even with um, the support of UNICEF, we've launched many pilot projects. Like in Thailand, for example, we're training these young girls to understand how they can strengthen their own movement. And one of our girls has actually created um, a solution to engage with young people in their schools and their teachers to talk about, you know, how can you empower youth in your classroom to become leaders? And so this is, um, you know, a project of, of hers, the photo on this screen, but it's projected to reach almost 200,000 young people in Thailand. So it's incredible work that we've been able to empower more young leaders to transform education globally. And we see photos here as well of our other chapters that have been able to involve more young people from all different ages and inspire them to want Want to learn and um, provide them with access to education. But this is just a small subset of the work that we're doing. And, you know, there's so many young leaders like everyone on this call today and beyond who are part of our movement that are working to transform education. But the gap remains in empowering everyone around us to, to notice education as a public priority. And so we've done the awareness building, we um, are doing the policy and training, and we're also doing the grass, um, the grass, the grassroots movement. So it's all this combination that of work that really requires us to transform education. But with the amount of um, work that we see with our advocates in climate and health and gender, we all need to work together because you know we're not just an education advocate. I'm a health advocate, a gender advocate, and an education advocate, and a climate advocate. And we all need to be that. We all need to care about the intersection of all the SDGs so that we can create a more prosperous world for us all. Um, but that brings me to the end of um, the presentation. If you have any ideas or would like to get involved, please do not hesitate to reach out. We'd be more than happy to get you involved in the movement. Thank you. This is so incredible. And having been at TESS 
and you know, and the, the pre-summit, um, I think, uh, Kanisha, we were sort of quickly attempting to, you know, meet up on the on the sidelines. And I saw how extremely busy you were then. But this is amazing to get the full sort of story of the movement building. And, um, you know, we have a time for a couple of quick questions. Um, the biggest one, I think, on lots of people's mind would be for Tess 2.0 or whatever we're calling it coming up for September and beyond. And then also how can um, you know, people for follow up, we hear there will be another big education meeting some at some point in 2024. Um, and then, of course, um, we're both, you know, this is such an important time in 2023, right, because we're at the midpoint of the SDGs. How do we accelerate progress post COVID and considering everything we've discussed today that in terms of the great needs, but at the same time, prepare and make sure full disability inclusion, menstrual hygiene, some of these areas that didn't make it into the SDGs back in negotiations in 2015, the data, the political will is ready to go in time before across the UN system, things start to get decided for what, what might be SDG 2.0, right? So we'd love any insights, recommendations, ideas you have for what's coming up, not just for next month, but beyond. And then if you are do have access to respond in the chat, there have been some great questions raised um uh wanted to quickly uh mostly people just saying how incredible you are and um that this is um really amazing um but if people do have any other specific questions please let us know thank you again well thank you so much jennifer and you're absolutely right i mean we are at the midpoint and this is you know more pressure now than ever for us to change the ways that we've been running the school systems and and I can't remember the last time um, there was a difference that was noted in how education was done, you know, back in the day and, and how it's being done now. So a lot of there's been like a lot of missed opportunities in education for sure that you mentioned. And with um, you know, the, the SDG summit coming up, I think that's a great opportunity to really empower people to, you know, who are not traditional education advocates to see education as a solution for all the issues that we see in the different SDGs. You know, I talk about how climate literacy can transform climate action and how financial literacy can really transform our financial and economic prosperity in society. And so I think it really, that is the, the key point and intersection that we have is focusing on looking at education as a solution and a foundation for the change, you know, because it really is by educating more people about COVID-19, we were able to put a stop to the epidemic quite fast if you look at it historically with the other epidemics that we've had. So I think, um, you know, now more than ever, we have to recognize education as a solution, but the follow up, what does that look like, right? Because it, it's, it's all great when we talk about it and we come together and we advocate, but the action is really when all the work happens. And so at least on the youth side, what we're doing is trying to train young people who came to test and even were involved in the consultations that we had to understand how they can make a difference. So for young people on the call today, if you're passionate about transforming education, think about you know how can you make a difference in your classroom to start with? How can you make a difference in your school? Is there a difference that you wanna make? Is Do you notice any you know inaccessibilities to young people who are maybe don't look like you, who maybe don't have the same privileges as you, or maybe what about for yourself and the community that you represent? Do you notice any barriers in your education system? Do you think the quality of education could be improved and perhaps, you know, empower teachers around you to think about how you can co-create in your classroom and in your school? And then do you notice any larger issues in your community? You know, think about frameworks that you can address. And if you think about anything beyond or than, you know, community, what about in your country at large? And what about globally? And if you're thinking about, you know, I'm so scared, I don't know how to approach this. Like I have an idea, but I don't really know how. Bother me. You can like spam my email anytime. I would be more than happy to, you know, give you resources and ideas on how I was able to pass the motion and how you can do so as well to make a difference. But if you're someone who wants to organize more of a grassroots movement and think about ways that you can just help, you know, your peers around you with accessing STEM education after school. I really started off with, um, you know, supporting my peers who are visually impaired to join our STEM workshops that I had the privilege of accessing. And so you could do the same as well. And if you're looking for resources or places to start, my nonprofit organization is just one of them that is, you know, 
hoping to inspire more hope spreaders and people to champion more initiatives. So you can definitely, you know, um, we'd be happy to give you our resources as well. And then globally, what we're doing is with this framework that I mentioned, the three pillars, we're trying to, with the youth indicator that we launched, we're trying to urge member states to um, have education and young people's voices in education incorporated. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, we are part of like the high level steering committee for education. We actually launched this youth indicator, which is I'm proud to say um, the only youth indicator right now in the SDG framework that focuses on youth engagement. So what does this mean? Well. For a country to get a check mark for achieving SDG 4, that means they are required to engage young people in a meaningful way, and that metric is still being developed. So that means for a country to say that we've achieved SDG 4 and we're providing quality education, that means young people need to be involved. And I think that starts from a systemic change, but if you're someone who wants to get more involved with the policy and grassroots, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. This is amazing. We really appreciate all that you're doing. Um, and exactly, this new youth indicator will make a huge difference. Um, and I think as we're working with colleagues um, across the UN system and those working on it, you know, really important to make sure that the indicators on disability inclusive education get added as well, not just gender as the sort of sole indicator from tests for all aspects of inclusion. So much, much advocacy and work to be done together. And then thanks to everybody who's been asking about girls education or specific topic areas, what more can we do? We wanted to also invite everyone to please let us know um, if you're, you, your colleagues, um, partners have additional ideas, suggestions, would like to be involved in future um, Chatham House rules, um, uh, more confidential discussions uh, with policymakers on this front, um, because we know how sensitive it is. And I shared my contact information there um, as well. And, and especially before the UN assessment, um, which will be launched November 17th on Afghanistan writ large, we're working with colleagues to try to help make sure that that will hopefully um, not cause additional harm, but provide more uh, human rights mechanisms. So we're extremely thankful to all of you, the speakers, the participants, everybody today that's been wonderfully um, active. And hopefully this is just a launch, part, launch point for even more partnership and joint action to come. We want to extend a very big thank you to all of our wonderful speakers for their fantastic presentations today. Uh, in honor of International Youth Day with all these great things that were just outlined coming up uh, later today to join in on and over the next two days as well. We encourage everyone to continue these vital conversations and partnerships and advocate for global education and human rights together. Um, you can see a couple of ways to connect with GCE US and please reach out to us anytime as well. If your organization or as an individual or student group would like to become part of GCUS or we can join in and be supportive of what you're doing. We would love to talk. And, and then globally, the GCE movement is active in over 100 countries. Um, and our colleague Kate is active with 100 million. There are so many amazing groups uh, working across uh, the Global Student Forum, et cetera. So um, if you would like to get more connected, please just reach out and we, we're happy uh, to, to help with that. Throughout the rest of this month, um, immediate actions and thanks. We've heard from some of you that have already taken these actions um, and reached out to your policymakers. We have um, some online tools that make it super easy. It, it literally only takes 30 seconds. So please, even if you've done it before, now is a critical time to reach out to members of Congress urging support for the Read Reauthorization Act. The original Read Act uh, will be, that authorization will end at the end of this September. So we literally just have a few weeks uh, to make sure in a complex political environment that uh, this passes and so and goes as far as it possibly can to, sh to show that congressional intent for this important work to be funded and expanded, not to, to shrink. Please also sign on to the fiscal year 2024 conference letter um, that's being shared in the chat to encourage more funding while negotiations are taking place about possible budget cuts um, across Congress uh, in the US context. And we also have a statement, thanks to our colleague Kate for drafting it, where all individual organizational quotes would be welcome. We're happy for this to be a joint 
community statement and it would be really helpful for people to join in. Uh, we need to make the biggest noise we possibly can, um, bigger than we've ever done before. So we have organizations that have signed on to previous conference letters of this type, pushing for the highest possible funding level for, base, for education, which includes girls' education across US government. Um, but unfortunately, cuts of one third are on the table. And Maha has done the calculations as to what that would mean. So if anybody wants to get more involved, just reach out to us. We're happy to help invite you to the task force and the meetings working on, on that type of advocacy. Coming soon, World Humanitarian Day, August 19th, International Literacy Day, September 8th. And we hear that our colleagues at USAID want to really do literacy-focused campaigning for the entire month of September. So all ideas are welcome. Please let us know what you're planning. Um, thanks, huge thanks to everybody who's co-sponsoring. If you'd like to get involved, just let us know. Um, a joint uh, Hill event in Washington, DC on September 13th um, related to the READ Act. And then of course, we've been talking about the New York activities coming up um, next month in September, October International Day of the Girl, COP with the first ever Education Day um, right behind that in November. So please let us know if you have any announcements to share for these upcoming opportunities, things that you're planning, things that you'd like to feature at future uh, GCEUS coalition meetings or joint events and actions. And um, in our last few minutes, over to Maha, we have this amazing opportunity um, by this coming, uh, we've extended it to August 15th. Um, and if you need more time or would like to hold um, a conversation with a group that we can help you facilitate, just let us know. Um, Maha, please close us out and help uh, um, share this great opportunity to give input. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for being here today. So GCE US recently hosted, hosted the Deputy Administrator, Assistant Administrator for the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub um, for USAID, Bama Etrea, for a spotlight session during the Global Action Week for Education. Um, during that discussion, it revolved around power shifting, youth engagement, and after the session, the Deputy Assistant Administrator, Bama Etrea, posed some questions back to the civil society to share about how to best engage youth in decision-making processes. As we heard from our amazing youth activists and leaders today and about their work, it really highlights the need to engage youth at all levels for a more work. So please join us in sharing your ideas and recommendations about how to best engage youth in decision making processes and continue this con conversation on inclusion, power shifting and localization. So I'm going to be posting a link in the chat. Um, this link is to a Jamboard and it will also and there is also one link for the Google form. Please fill it out by 15th August. And if you need more time, as Jennifer said, please do let us know. And also please share it with other civil society partners, um, add in your feedback, suggestions, and any recommendations you have for us. Um, we will surely be compiling all of these recommendations and so we'll send it over to the Deputy Ad Assistant Administrator's office. Um, thank you so much for being here today and we look forward to connecting with all of you in the future and we look forward to having all of these meaningful conversations again. Have a great day. Thank you. This is perfect. And just to clarify, you don't need to do the Jamboard and the, the form. We just provided this as two different ways. Um, if you'd rather stick a small sticky note on the Jamboard with a brief idea or put something more in depth through the form, either way will work. And you can reach out to us anytime. We'll share our general email address again um, because we would love everybody to share your ideas. This is a great tool to give input, not just to the US government, but then all governments and policymakers on how we want to see youth engagement, child and youth participation change, and policymaking to be much more inclusive moving forward. So thank you all. We look forward to future actions and we're so grateful to you for your partnership, advocacy and support. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.